we have been in the midst of a series called Declare It. A series where we are growing, building, stirring on the fact that God has called us to be his declaration in the earth. We started off remembering that God had a design for us in the beginning where we were in relationship with him and relationship with each other, relationship with creation, and where we had access to eternal life. But we disrupted God's divine order for things when we decided to reach out and take hold of the fruit all on our own. We stepped out of God's designed divine order for our lives. We disrupted our relationship with God. We disrupted our relationships with each other. We disrupted our relationship with creation. And because of that, we were separated from access to eternal life. But in spite of all of that, God still came to find us hiding in the garden and let us know that he had an eternal plan for us still, that there would be one who came who would crush the head of the serpent who had deceived us into disrupting his divine order. And then the second week we remembered and recalled or maybe learned for some of us for the first time that Jesus has always been God's plan to come to us. Jesus didn't show up when Matthew began writing his account of Jesus' life on earth, but we remembered that Jesus shows up for us time and time again and is revealed to us in shadow, in type, and in these moments where he comes to be visible from heaven. We remembered that as the three Hebrew boys faced the fire of their life, that Jesus was right there with them. We remembered that as we read the Old Testament scriptures, we should be looking for Jesus throughout them because Jesus has always been there. And last week we focused in on John 3, 16 and 17 as Phil reminded us that it is God's love that caused him to send Jesus on mission. That when Jesus stepped out of heaven, he didn't just step out casually, but he stepped out on intention and on mission, on purpose to come into the earth and to be the one who came to save us, to redeem us, to reorder everything that that was disrupted we were reminded that for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have access once again to eternal life that he did not come into the world to condemn the world but for one reason I added that part that the world might be saved through him it is the core, the essence, the focus, the foundation, the whole thing of our faith and of why Jesus came. That God so loved that he sent his one and only son. And as I was preparing for today, I wondered, do you remember when that scripture became real to you? Maybe for some of us today, it hasn't become real for you yet. That's why you're here. You're here searching and wondering. You're here because someone else told you that it was real, but you're still not sure. And to you, I would say there is no better place that you can be this morning than in the midst of people who that verse has become real to. Do you remember when you decided and said, I believe? in Jesus. When you said, maybe you lifted your hand in a service, or maybe you gathered with a friend and prayed a prayer and said, today I'm saying yes to becoming a follower of Jesus. I don't actually remember this moment, but I know it because it's been told to me. And as the story goes, when I was three years old, I marched myself out of my bedroom and came and found my mom and said, I have decided that I would now like to invite Jesus into my heart. With all the confidence of a three-year-old and with all the frustration that apparently I had wasted enough time in my young life and was ready to now make the 
big decision of becoming a follower of Jesus. I remember being about 13 years old and being in an evening service and coming down to the altar somewhere on this side and having a moment where that early decision became real to me in a new way. When I decided to a new capacity that Jesus, I am committing my life to being a follower of you. I remember being in my senior year of high school and the weight and the reality that I would soon be an adult responsible for all of my own decisions with some financial backing from my parents for a couple more years became very real to me and I began to hunger after who he was in a new way and I began to skip my lunch so I could take more time in go into the library and study his word and spend time with other friends who were followers of Jesus spend time praying over our school I remember these moments where that scripture became real to me again and again and again and if I had to categorize the story of my walk with Jesus, I would categorize it and I would tell you that it is a continual unveiling. Some of you have had a radical moment where your life looked one way and you smacked into Jesus and everything turned around and your story is worth telling. And some of your stories sound more like mine where it's like I knew a little bit more and I knew a little bit more and I just decided somewhere along the way to keep saying yes to who he is and keep saying yes to what he laid in front of my life and that story is worth telling. Because today we've talked about the fact that we disrupted our relationship with God and we've talked about the fact that it was always Jesus and we've talked about the fact that God had a plan and a mission when he sent his one and only son. And today I want to talk to you about the power of your story, that you have a story to tell that you have a proclamation to make that there's a declaration that God has put inside of your life and inside of your mouth that is uniquely yours and that that story is worth telling will you turn with me to the book of John once again this time we're gonna go to chapter 4 the book of John chapter 4 tells the story of Jesus encountering a woman. He meets her at a well and her life has one of those I smacked into Jesus and everything just did a 180 in my life type of moments. But I want you to scroll farther down in the chapter all the way to verse 39. This is after she has met Jesus and after they've had a conversation and after she's run into the city to tell everyone, let me tell you about this man that I met who told me everything about my life. And then in John 4, starting in verse 39, it says, and many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony he told me all that I ever did and so when the Samaritans came to him they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there for two days and then many more believed because of his word and they said to the woman it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Jesus, I thank you for the stories that you're writing in this room and on this stream and through this podcast and wherever this message might go. I thank you that you are revealing to us our stories. I thank you that someone's story will be started today. I thank you for the stories that we'll tell and the stories that we'll share. And I thank you for those who will meet you because of these stories. In your mighty name, Jesus, amen. Story 
stories are incredibly powerful things in the way that they share from, from one person to another and the way that they connect people group to another people group. There is all kinds of research that you can do about the profound impact of the ability to tell a story and our ability to grab onto and to maintain and to connect to a story. Stories have always been the way that we share our history and share stories have always been the way that we understand who we are and where we came from and what our purpose is in this earth. The way that we can locate ourselves and the way that we can begin to anchor and ground ourselves is often found through our shared storytelling, through the power of knowing this is the story of who I am and this is the story of how I got here and this is the story of what it means to be me and what it's like to be among my people and what it meant for us to journey through or what it meant for us to survive in hardship, or what it meant for us to get all the way to the mountaintop. The ways that we tell our stories are important. You can tell a story from a certain angle, and you can tell a story from a certain bent, and the way that you tell the story of how you came through has a lot to do with then the identity that you begin to develop about who your people are. If the way that you tell the story of of your poverty is that your people can never get ahead and your people have always been held down by some other power and some other oppressor and your people have always been on the bottom and we have always struggled and we're always going to struggle. It becomes the identity of who you are because your story has the power to shape the world and the reality that you live in or if you tell the story of your people that we are a people who have have always found a way to survive even in the midst of meager beginnings and we are a people who have always found a way to be resourceful even when it seemed like we'd come to our end that we are a people who always trusted that God would give us something to survive and it looked like there were times when the barrel was all the way dry but the people that you come from are a people who know how to take just a little bit and make it into a lot it's the same story but the angle that you tell it from and the perspective that you give to it forms the reality that you live in and the identity be careful about the stories that you tell yourself about the moment that you're living in and the time that you find yourself in because the story you tell yourself begins to frame where you are stories are powerful tools Stories have power to connect us to one another and to begin to knit our lives and our hearts to intertwine the way that your story and my story are connected and the way that his faithfulness is the same through all of them, though it shows up in different ways. Our stories are powerful. Your story is powerful. And one of the dangers that we look at in society today is that we have lost the art of sharing our stories. We have lost the art of telling the tales of where we came from and who we are and how we got to be to the place that we're in. We have lost the divine skill, I believe, that God gave us to be those who take what happens in a moment and capture it in story and share it from person to person. When we share our stories, we share more than just facts and details. We share heart and we share spirit and we share experience. And we are losing our ability and our love for sharing stories. One of the reasons we're losing it is because we are losing the places where we share our stories. 
over history, stories were shared around fires that were in the center of a village where the people were required to have the fire burning to ward off enemies and to keep heat and to make sure that there was something to cook and there was always a fire burning. And in the evening hours, the people would come out and they would gather around the fire. And as they gathered around the fire together from culture to culture to culture, you can find something similar that they would sit around the fire and around the fire the stories would be shared and our fires evolved into our tables where we would sit and share stories or our leagues where we gathered with teams and we shared our stories or even our churches where we came out together and became the place where we share our stories but we are losing our places where we share our stories and instead we stay in our own space you cannot share a story when you are not connected to other people and instead of sharing our stories we watch someone else's story be told and we live in second and one of the other reasons we're losing our stories is because we are disconnecting from the heart of a story and we care too much about our particulars we want to know what are the data and what are the facts and what are the details and what does the research say and all of those things have their place and all of those things have great value but the power of a story is not in its detail is not in its fact is not in its data finding or sharing the power of a story is in the way that it forms who i am and what has happened to me and where i have come from we share we've lost the power of sharing our stories because we want to leave parts of our stories out there are all of our stories that have moments that are not as savory as other moments of our stories. All of our stories have parts of our stories that it would be better and preferable for our ego if they were left untold. But it is the most unsavory parts of our story that have the power to build the identity of the things we have come through and the things we have overcome. And in a moment and in a time when, like any other, we are so concerned with the presentation of who we are, it seems more valuable to leave out certain parts of our story. And we do a disservice to those who are hearing our story when we do not tell all of the parts of our story. And so our proclamation is hindered and our proclamation is diminished and our proclamation is watered down because we do not have the places to sh share our stories and we're more concerned with the particulars of our story than we are concerned with the heart and the narrative and the connectivity of our story. And we don't want to tell the parts of our story that don't line up with the framework we have been building. And in a, as a result, our stories are lost and our stories are diminished but your story in all of its realness and in all of its reality and in all of its ugliness and in all of its mess your story has power stories have an incredible amount of power they connect to us they connect people to people and let me tell you without fail Every single week, someone will come up to me after service and say to me, I loved how you were talking about how Phil was eating those chips. That is so funny because we also love chips in our house. And I'll be like, did you hear when I broke down the etymology of that word, though? I gave you a lot of ancient context about why that scripture is. Did you see how I connected the Old Testament to then what was happening in the New? It took me a lot of hours to come up with all of And you're like, yeah, 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 but those chips, though. <laughs> and there's a reason for this. Because stories connect us one to another. They locate us. 
They find something that we all share in and that we all have part in and that we all can go, I remember that moment. I've had that feeling. I've had that experience. And even if your moment, if your feeling, if your thing isn't exactly like the story you're hearing, there's something in it that you can connect to. Your story has a connection point. Stories are memorable. You remember some, your brain is wired to remember stories. You will leave something and forget the details that they told you and forget the exact facts of what they laid out for you and all of the minutia of what happened, but you will remember a story. There is something applicable in a story. I know what to do from here. You can lay out verse by verse. You can lay out person by person. You can lay out argument by argument. And at the end of all of that, I still might have the question, and what do I do now? But when you tell me your story, I know how to apply it. Let me give you an example. Andres talked about egg hunt a few minutes ago. I could come up here and tell you, over the last 10 years, we've seen over 8,000 kids come through. Every year, 600 different kids sign up for egg hunt and have walked through egg hunt. We've packed 10,000 eggs per year. That's over 100,000 eggs over the last decade that have been filled and handed out in this community. We've doubled our time slots and we've already seen them almost all the way filled. And you're gonna be like, that's cool. Or I could tell you that last year I talked to a family that hasn't been in church in a long time because they had a situation with another family in the church that left them feeling really heartbroken. But while they were out in the hallway waiting for their turn to line up, some of our team came and talked to them and loved on their kids. And then when they came in this room and they were waiting, their kids ticket was the raffle that got pulled and they won one of the extra prizes and then they went through and they got to see all of the different rooms and all of the different people that were part of celebrating their family and celebrating their kids and when they finished going all the way through their egg hunt their two little kids said this was so much fun we should really come back here again sometimes and then someone from our team gave them a final farewell basket and said we'd love to see you back here on a Sunday morning. Here's all the information that you need to be part of that. And then that following week, they got a text message from you all saying, we had so much fun with you at the egg hunt that we would love to see you again this Sunday. And so then for the first time in three years, on that Saturday afternoon, that couple said, you know what, why don't we give church one more go? And a husband and a wife and their two kids decided to get up on a Sunday morning and come back into church for the first time and you get to be part of all of that if you decide to come out and but that's why we have an egg hunt not because it's so much fun to feel 10,000 eggs because somebody's story is at the end of what happens there because somebody's story is being laid out and be, is being told in the midst of it. I'm asking you to come out and be part of what's happening because your story of having a rhythm of resilience that serves on at least a monthly basis is getting ready to collide with someone else's story who is coming, longing, searching, wondering, is there anyone left who cares about me and my family because our story are what are powerful. It is our story that has the power to break the strongholds on people's lives. It is our story that has the power to shake people from the place of turmoil, from the place of chaos, from the place of depression that they're being held in. It is your story that does that. Look what Revelation says. 
Revelation 12, starting in verse 9, says, And then the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have been conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony for they loved their lives not even unto death and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and their deep theology they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and their articulate arguments they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the way that they voted They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and their political party becoming in power. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony. They conquered the power of the enemy, this serpent that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. They conquered the one who is whispering deceit into your ear. They conquered the one who is whispering division into your ear. They conquered the one who is whispering doubt into your ear. They conquered the one who is whispering destruction into your ear by the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony it's the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony your story is no small thing your story is no trifling matter your story is a power it is a wielded weapon in the hand of a believer who is going after an oppressive enemy who wants to hold the people and the children of God in captivity and let me tell you this Jesus has done his part The blood of the lamb has been poured out. The blood of the lamb was poured out for all creation and for all mankind back on Calvary when he hung on that cross, when he went into the grave and when he rose again, he has poured out his blood. It is the word of the testimony of the believers that now comes alongside as those who say we have been redeemed by his blood and we have a story to tell we have a testimony that goes out and it breaks the lies of darkness because when the enemy says to you that you're never going to get on the other side of this I have a story to tell that says I was on the rock bottom and I wasn't sure if I was ever coming back but God was with me in the midst of it we have a story to tell that combats every lie of the enemy every deceit that he's bringing against you every time he comes to you and he says you're just always going to be in depression and you're just always going to feel sad and you're just always going to feel too small and you're just always going to feel I have a story to tell that says late in the midnight hour I thought that I was overcome by depression and I thought darkness had overcome me and I thought there was nothing I could do to come back from it but I found a joy that comes in the morning I found a joy that no one can take away I found a joy that is my strength all the way down to my soul I found a joy that rises up I found a song to sing and I've got a story to tell your story has power your story has power in it whatever your story it is yours it is your story to tell and we need your story to be told we need to hear of the way that you overcame addiction we need to hear of the way that you raised those kids all on your own we need to hear of the way that you came back from being fired We need to hear of the way that you built the type of life that you never saw modeled in front of you with the blood of the lamb and the power of your testimony. And this woman has a story to tell. 
we know actually remarkably little about this woman's story. Jesus is waiting for her, presumably, at a well. He has sat at a well by himself, Jacob's well, and sent his disciples into town to get food. And while he waits at the well in the middle of the day, a woman comes out by herself to dip water from the well. It tells us a lot because it would have been common practice for the women to come out together. And it would have been a more usual time for them to come early in the morning or late in the evening. No one comes to get water from the well in the heat of the day. But this woman apparently wanted to come when no one else would be there. It tells us that most likely she did not have amicable relationships with the other women in her community. And so she came to the well by herself. And she meets Jesus at that well, and they begin having a conversation. And in the midst of this conversation, Jesus says to her, go get your husband, which is a setup question from Jesus because she says back to him, I don't have a husband. And he says, correct. You have had several husbands. You have had five, and the one you're with now is not your husband. You're on man number six, and you didn't even bother marrying this one, or he didn't bother marrying you. And we never are told why. Why has this woman had so many husbands? And it has left us to make suppositions about who she is and about her character. It has left people to portray her from different perspectives. There are those who have portrayed her as a loose woman who went around town and was discarded by man after man. There are those who have portrayed her as a barren woman who was unable to have children, which would have been a legal reason for her to be divorced at the time. There are those who have portrayed her as a perpetual widow who time after time has suffered the death of a husband and been remarried to someone new. If we're walking down that, I've watched enough true crime that I think if she's got that many husbands dying somebody should look into the food I'm just saying there's a lot of questions about this woman and no details are given to us about why this is the case in her story which tells me that you don't deserve as many details about other people's stories as you think that you do what we know about her is that there must have been heartache there must have been pain it also tells me that you are not required to tell as many details about your story as you feel like you have to this becomes a hang-up for us, that if I tell my story, I have to tell every gruesome single detail of it. And let me just tell you, you don't. There is a way to tell your story, to tell about what you came over and tell about what you came through without spilling every single detail out because you don't need that and the people who are hearing your story don't need that. It is sufficient to say that there was heartache and Jesus saw her in her pain. And he spoke to her and she suddenly felt seen and felt known by this man who was sitting by a well asking for a drink of water. And Jesus reveals himself to this woman, not just as Jesus, not just as a prophet. He says, I am the Messiah that you are talking about. I am that Messiah. She's among the first, some think the very first, to know that he is the Messiah that has come. 
And it says in John 4 and 29, it says she turns around and she runs back to the city. She's so excited that she leaves the pot that she took with her back at the well. And she runs into the town and she says, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. And can this be the Christ. She is so excited about the thing that has just happened to her. She is so excited about the fact that she has just met Jesus. She lives with that excitement all the way at the top of her that she has to run and declare the news that she has in the city that I come see this man. I found him. I have found the one. And this is where we often end the telling of her story. And it's a good place to wrap it up that she goes and tells everybody. But it's not where John ends the retelling of her story. See, John is a master storyteller. He knows how to retell a story in the way that he is weaving in all of the pertinent details and drawing your attention to exactly what he wants to make sure that you understand and can apply by the time you leave this story. And while this woman goes into town to declare to everyone that the Christ has now come and that she has talked to him and they need to come see him too, the disciples come back in and Jesus begins a conversation conversation with them and they have a conversation that often seems strange with Jesus because they he told them to go get food now they've come back with food and now he doesn't want to eat because he apparently has heavenly food and his food is to do the will of the one who sent me and once again the disciples are like Jesus walking with you is not so easy some days what are you talking about and then he starts talking to them about seed time and harvest, that there are some who sow, and there are some who water, and there are some who harvest, and there is a time for harvest, and there is a moment for harvest, and what is John doing here? He has He has put this conversation right in the middle of this woman going to tell her story and us getting ready to come back. He is apparently trying to connect for us the thought and the fact and the reality and the application that if we want to see a harvest of those who are coming into the kingdom of God, if we want to see a harvest of those who have seeds have been sown in their life and things have been watered in their life and a moment is now here for them to come and that it is the stories that we tell that make all the difference in the moment of a harvest because after this conversation what we come to is we come to John 4 and 39 where we started where it says and many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony He told me all that I ever did. Can I tell you, someone's belief is waiting on your story. They believed in him because of her story. They believed in him because they heard her come and share her testimony that she had met the one who told her everything about herself. And this is what I don't want you to miss about her story. Nothing materially has changed in her life yet. Her life materially is the same as it was that afternoon when she headed for the well. She still has five previous husbands. Nothing's changing that in her life. She still presumably is living with this man she was because it doesn't say she went back to town and she got everything together and she sorted out the messy life that she was living and she sorted out her relationships with all the other women and went through a six month reconciliation process. And then when she had all that together, she said, hey town, can you gather up? I'd like to tell you the thing that prevents us from telling our story that I left out earlier is a desire for perfection. You will never obtain perfection. And we hold on to our story because I still have some things I need to get together. 
and we hold on to our story because it's still kind of a mess over here and we hold on to our story because well I haven't quite got this area how I need it to and we hold on to our story because well in six more months I'll really feel like I've walked all the way away from that thing and we keep holding on to it because the line of perfection is ever moving it is always just a few more steps away perfection is just always out of your grip and it becomes the illusion of the reason for you to stay silent and it's because we think our stories are about us but her story was not come and look how I got my life together her story was not, come and look how everything in my life has been put back together. Her story was not, come and look how clean I am now. Her story was not, come and look how tidy my story is now. Her story was not, come and look how I've been working over the last 18 months and got everything back together. Her story was not about her. Her story was about Jesus. Your story is about the fact that I have met the one who told me everything I needed to know about myself her story was about come and see him come and look at him come and listen to him you have a story to tell that's nothing about how perfect your life is and is nothing about how everything in your life has come together the story that you have to tell is come I have met him I have met Jesus I have met him and your story has power. Aesop had his fables about life and Lencioni tells his tales about leadership and Jesus had his parables to reveal the kingdom and you have your story to tell, to say come and see, I have met the one who told me everything about myself. I've met him. I found him. I've got things to put back together still. And I have questions about what that looks like still. And I don't need you looking at me so much. I need you to look at him because I have met him. And it says many believed in him because of her. Who is waiting on the other side of your story. You have a story to tell about meeting the one who sees you, about meeting the one who knows you, about meeting the one. Is there anyone who knows that they have a story to tell about the way that Jesus saw you, about the way that Jesus found you, about how he was waiting for you when you were avoiding everyone? Is there anyone who has a story to tell about how he redeemed you, about how he saved you, about how he walks with you, about how he talks with you, about how he's been good to you, about how he's been kind to you. Her story was not about her. Your story doesn't have to be about you. Your story is simple. Come and see. I have met the one. I have met the one who saw me. I have met the one who knows me. I have met the one who changed and many of them of the town believed and they hung on that belief it says they hung not on their belief in him not on their faith in him they're hanging on your story they're hanging on the story you will tell until in John 40 and 40 it says and then the Samaritans came to him for themselves and they asked him to stay with them and they stayed there for two days and then many more believed because of his word and then they told the woman it is no longer because of what you said that we have believed but we have heard for ourselves and we know it that this is indeed the savior of the world they hang on your story until they can hear it for themselves they hung on her story until the moment when they could hear for themselves until the moment where they said we've heard your story enough that we believe in him but there's part of me that needs to hear it for myself someone came here today because you heard someone else's story long enough
enough that you said I believe in what you're saying but it's time for me to hear it for myself it's time for me to hear for myself that he sees me it's time for me to hear for myself that he knows me it's time for me to hear for myself that he loves me that he came for me that he's waiting for me that there is a God who loves you and when they heard it for themselves it says they believed in him your story is the bridging belief that moves somebody from disbelief to hearing from him for yourself it's powerful and you have to tell it and I know in this room today there are those who said I came here because of someone else's belief I came here because I heard somebody else's story. But today, I've heard him for myself. Today, I've felt him for myself. Today, I'm moving from I believe because of your story into I believe because of who he is. If that's you and you know that you're saying, I believe in him, that he is the savior of the world and I need to be in relationship with him, I just want you to shoot your hand up all across this this room I see you love right here saying I believe in him I see you sir in the middle I see you guys in this section lifting hands and saying if you've lifted your hand can you just stand with with me with those who are standing to say I believe in him not because of my spouse's story anymore and not because of my cousin's story anymore my mom's story held me for a while but today I hear him and I believe in him with hands lifted high, say these words with me. Jesus, I come to you today and I believe in you. I believe in your life. I believe in your death. I believe in your burial and resurrection. And today, I'm letting go of a life that was led by me and I'm taking hold of a life led by you for all my days. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 